which you'll probably finish a little bit after lunch also, which is fine. Okay, let's continue with derivatives. And I'll be honest, what I've done here is uh, made a problem that is supposed to have like every kind of issue, every type of common student issue that, that I can. And I'm going to pack this into one problem. You'll see there's a little theme here. And the theme is, how do you do it? How do you do it when you're kind of faced with what appears to be some strange terms? All right, well, hopefully not panic and hopefully start to become the student that realizes, okay, um, I've shown you these things, but how can we apply them, obviously, to this problem? Um, first off, 1 over x, kind of why did that sneak in there? Just because I know that that always is going to need some help. Um, how do you think about this problem? I'm trying to get you to realize that that's the answer. You have to think about the problem a little differently. You have to think about negative exponents. So we always think of 1 over x as x and negative 1. Now, I hope there becomes a point, maybe it's already, maybe it's next week, maybe it's next month, but that you kind of just do that in your head. Because because I want you to understand it. So if you can do that in your head, then you can do the derivative with a negative exponent. And when you do a derivative with a negative exponent, you're always going to bring the negative down. You're always going to subtract from the negative. And so you're always going to get negative x and negative 2. But the reason I kind of encourage you eventually you do that in your head is so we can arrive at 1 or check that negative 1 over x squared and kind of arrive at that nice, neat final derivative. Okay, so the derivative of 1 over x is the opposite of 1 over x squared. And there's some song and dance with negative exponents. How about 1 over tangent? Now, that's not something we've been doing like every day, but it is something that kind of has the same approach. How do you think of it? Well, the answer goes back to something a little more from last year. Okay, because anytime you see 1 over tangent, again, last year, that's the same as cotangent. It's the same as cotangent. So all this is is just a little cotangent in disguise. Now, it's different, right? I'm not like thinking of it as negative exponents. That's because it's a trig function, and it follows a little different, basically, identity. But the good news is, once I change it to cotangent, the derivative is, well, something that you will memorize as the opposite of cosecant squared. Notice that uh, some of these answers are just that. It's an answer that you write down. You're going to find out that some things in calculus don't take 10 steps. It's just knowing the rule. And so the rule for cotangent is negative cosecant squared. And I'm ready to move on to the last one. Now, I don't know if the last one we need to really make a little bubble thinker, but it seems like a nice theme, so we'll put it there because you need to think of this as a product. You need to think of it as a product. Now, you saw that a little bit yesterday, and I'm bringing that back up because I just know that it's an issue. So this problem is full of issues. Now, when you do x tangent of x, you do the product rule, if you want to write the word rule under it, but you have to do the product rule. You have to do the first times the derivative of the second. So it's x, the derivative of tangent. Of course, the derivative of tangent is secant squared. So that's first derivative of second plus the second. Now that would be tangent. I'm just going to copy that down times the derivative of the first. 
Now, the derivative of the first would be the derivative of x, and of course, that's the number 1. You don't really need to write that. I'm just going to put it down and then erase it because ultimately I just end up with tangent. It's a good problem. Okay. I figure if we're going to come, we might as well go over some stuff that I know is normally an issue for kids. All right. Now, let's take a look at a sort of a pseudo application problem. Um, it's not a word problem, but it's a pretty common calculus application. You've heard this language before. The language is the slope, or excuse me, the equation for the tangent line. The equation for the tangent line. And the answer, at least the answer to the method, is always the same. It's always going to involve a derivative. I want you, to, when you see this language, to always think derivative. Okay, now what you need to realize is that that's not all the answer this time. We're going to have to take an extra step. We're going to have to take that step to the y equals mx plus b, you know, the equation of the tangent line. But before we get to y equals mx plus b, let's, let's get the derivative. This wouldn't be a bad problem for you to kind of ponder. I'll kind of say to you, it's supposed to be an easier derivative, but don't take that as an insult if you're not sure how to do it. It's just, it's simple. So don't make it hard. It's simple. Try not to make it hard. How would you do the derivative? I like that you're trying it. Sometimes it's the only way that you're going to realize that you're maybe thinking of it a little overthinking or maybe uh, you're good. I see most of you said the derivative of 2 is 0. That's good. Let's just make that as easy as possible. The derivative of 2 is 0. Now, there's a little bit of a discrepancy on how to do the derivative of 3 cosine. But I got good news. 3 is just a coefficient. Now, I've said this a couple times, but this is probably another one of those issues that once you hear this and understand it, you'll make this easy. If you have a coefficient, it always just comes down for the ride. Now, it always has come down for the ride. It's just that you've never seen a coefficient in front of a trig function. What I'm saying here is that in order to do the derivative, all I really need to do is bring down the number 3 and then just do the derivative of cosine to be opposite sine. And to make it as simple as possible, that's it, unless we rewrite it as negative 3 sine. Now, some of you did the product rule, and it's okay. All right, we're, we'll learn. You see, the product rule, you can think of it as a product, but as soon as you do the second half of the product rule, what did you notice happens? What's the second times the derivative of the first? It's going to be cosine times zero. Okay, so just kind of take my advice. You don't have to use the product rule because you're always going to get a zero on the second half of it. Think of it as a coefficient. Coefficients just come down, and then you can do the derivative of the function. Okay, now, again, the product rule, it's just not necessary, although you still get the right answer. So you have negative three sine. Okay, now remember, negative 3 sine is a formula. It's a slope formula, but it's a formula. And what we do with formulas, what we do with slope formulas is we plug in. So we're going to plug in. We're going to find the slope at negative pi over 4. And again, that just means plugging in negative pi over 4. Now, you've plugged into some of our other formulas the last week or so, but we can plug into a trig formula. Just make sure you're following some good trig etiquette. You actually could do that problem on the unit circle. 
I'm not going to force you to do that. But as long as your calculator is in radians, it should be a pretty easy input output. Just make sure you can, you're getting it correct because you're going to do an exit ticket where you guys are going to have to fumble around a little bit with uh, some of this input output. Okay, now 2.12, that's the slope. That's the slope at negative pi over 4. Any issues just kind of with input output? Again, if your calculator is in radians, should work for you. Well, do you realize that our end goal is to get an equation of the form y equals mx plus b? We're getting there, right? We got the slope. Even though it's kind of looks a little bit like alt 1, this is good stuff but it makes you think one more time about how to get this y-intercept. And you guys did this a few times. You did it like in an assignment. I, I did some examples. But you have to remember that to get the y-intercept, we need a point. We need a point. In other words, we need the rest of negative pi over 4. Negative pi over 4 is the x value. We need the rest of that point. We need the y value. Where do you get y values from? Where do you get y values from? You get them from an equation. Now, implied by that is that you get them from the original equation. So I have to plug into the original equation. Usually it's not a big problem for students is if you're paying attention, but you do need to realize that you're plugging in negative pi over 4 into a couple different places. Make sure you're kind of aware of what place you're trying to plug into. And when you get 4.12, understand that that's a y value. That's a y value. Can you just walk behind the camera? Yeah. Okay, so. Kind of proceed on with your algebra and get that y intercept. Hey, these kind of decimals, they're fine. It's part of the part of the program. Um, some of these numbers may uh, have some type of significance with math. In other words, some type of like radian number. Uh, I'm not going to make you know that. Uh, I would kind of caution you against using the solution manual a little too much. Uh, meaning like, you know, sometimes the solution manual will take these decimals and they'll write them as some type of square root or some type of radian. I'm not making you understand that, so I almost expect to see some of these decimals as part of your answer. When you check your answer in the solution manual, you just need to be aware of converting a little bit. But I'm telling you again, the decimals are okay. Okay, any questions? Are you following? I'm doing some of the stuff on the calculator as we solve for y equals mx plus b. We get y equals 212, 212x plus 579 to a couple decimal places. Are you guys sure you're okay? Do you know what I'm going to do here? Are you a mind reader? You know what I'm going to do? What am I graphing? The original equation and the tangent equation. Why am I doing this? Because I don't have anything else to do? No, seriously, why am I doing this? You already know what you're going to see. Okay. Implied by this is that we should be now hit zoom trig. If you're playing along, hit zoom trig. Here's the cosine graph. And then here's the tangent line. And as I was kind of saying, you already know what you're going to see. We're trying to see the tangent behavior. Now, 
I probably should make the window get a little bigger because it looks like half of the action is up above. So I changed the Y maximum to be up at eight. And now that looks good. That's good math when we see the tangent line just kind of skipping off the graph at negative pi over four. You know how sometimes I have you sketch that? Just be aware that what we're trying to sketch is the behavior, the behavior that we see at negative pi over four. Just by the way, this is okay. It's allowed to intersect at other places. The tangent behavior is only at the x value. And so there's nothing wrong with other places. But again, that's good stuff. Maybe it even makes you smile a little bit here on a Wednesday. Now, I'm going to give you an exit ticket that most exit tickets are trying to do this, kind of force you to, to think about what we've done and also give you a chance to practice. I'm kind of warning you here that the derivative is a little more juicy. So I will tell you if you get the derivative correct, okay? Because the derivative is a quotient. It's a quotient. So again, I will tell you if you get the derivative correct. Because then, of course, you're going to be plugging into your derivative to help finish the rest of the problem. So, yeah, grab a half sheet of paper. Maybe grab a, a friend. And I will be your friend because I will tell you if you get the derivative correct.